This is CBC Here and Now. We are live in Bonavista, a town that not only survived after the Cod Moratorium, but reinvented itself, and today Bonavista is thriving. Senior politicians swap portfolios. Health is a 365 day a year portfolio. I look forward to the challenge. We have new health and education ministers. I'm Terry Roberts. We'll have that story coming up. For 13 years, Joan McCarthy defrauded her financial investment clients, and today she paid the price. I'm Arianna Kelland, and I'll have that story coming up. I said, I, said, I think we might be the first ones on the roads that connect, so. <laughs> a highway that's four decades in the making. The last stretch of pavement is laid over the Trans-Labrador Highway. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. My co-host Carolyn is live on location tonight. Yes, Peter, I am in the beautiful Garrick Theatre here in historic Bona Vista. It's been 30 years since the Cod Moratorium began and 30,000 people lost their jobs in this province. So many communities just emptied out, but Bonavista managed to survive and now it's a hub for tourism and for the arts. So we'll be live from Bonavista tonight and tomorrow night. We're going to meet some of the people who live and work here and who helped shape this new Bonavista. Thanks, Carolyn. We'll check in with you throughout the show, but we start today with a surprise cabinet shuffle involving two of the province's most recognizable politicians. They both played key roles in navigating this province through all the upheaval that came with the pandemic. Here now is Terry Roberts explains. This was the first hint that a notable political shakeup was about to happen. John Hagee, the long-serving health minister, arriving at Government House this morning. All will become clear in the fullness of time followed by this man. It's a beautiful day. The political face of education for the past two years and one of the province's longest serving MHAs. All was revealed inside, a short ceremony. In the office of Minister of Health and Community Services, so help me God. I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. With Hagee and Osborne switching jobs, Hagee as the new education minister after more than seven years in health, and Osborne shuffling into the Department of Health and Community Services, a role he's held before for less than a year in 2006, a stint remembered mostly for his involvement in an inquiry into a breast cancer testing scandal and the fact critical briefing notes were kept from him. The Commission of Inquiry provided a great deal of uh, insight, it provided recommendations. Premier Andrew Fury had high praise for both ministers, but said he felt it was time for a change. It's a natural time then, to, I think, during the summer when considering education to, to have a change, to reinvigorate the portfolios, to reinvigorate, reinvigorate the ministers. These past two years were anything but routine for these ministers. Hagee leading the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a cyber attack that paralyzed his department, and the Health Accord, which aims to reinvent the health system. Health is a 365 day a year portfolio. Uh, it's a challenge for anybody. It was an avalanche of challenges that tested his own health and put him in the crosshairs of those looking to lay blame. Some of the civility that we saw in public discussion before COVID disappeared during COVID. While Osborne oversaw a department trying to keep the education system functional during the pandemic, dealing with school closures and remote learning, three academic years unlike anything in modern history. Both these ministers have served the people of the province incredibly well. It's welcome news. It's long overdue. And but the opposition is taking a different tone, especially toward the outgoing health minister. It's unfortunate it took the premier this long uh, to make a decision and show leadership here and change things up to get things moving in the right direction. Uh, but we welcome it. This is a new fresh start. Haggy welcomes the change and says he planted the seed with the premier. I've talked about education and uh, how I, I had a, a, an interest in it, and uh, obviously it fell on fertile ground. Osborne says one of his top priorities is physician recruitment and retention. This is not only a, an issue in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's an issue in Canada. As for Hagee, he says affordable early childhood education is important to him. He says that will allow more people to enter the workforce. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. 
While staying with health, the Premier is responding to a story here now brought you on Friday. We travelled to Trapassi to learn about the trouble that area is having recruiting and retraining a family doctor. One physician who was willing to stay said it was a difficult decision to leave, but Eastern Health failed to make her an offer she could accept. Well, today Premier Andrew Fury said no one should doubt that this province has a strong desire to find and keep physicians. I'll put a plea out right now. If there's any doctors out there from in Newfoundland and Labrador who want to stay, who are elsewhere in Canada, who want to come, who are around the world, who want to come to Newfoundland and Labrador, reach out to my office directly. And if you have issues, reach out directly to me. That's the type of priority that we're placing on this. I can't speak to that specific employment uh, issue that was raised, but we are looking into it. Well, staying with health news, the Premier is also calling on the federal government to increase the amount of money it gives to the province to provide health care. Given the pressures created by COVID, given the inflationary pressures created, given the pressures created by an aging population or simply by inflation, we need to make sure that the federal government understands that they have a role to play now in increasing the funding. I think the Prime Minister understands that in the conversations that I've had with him. He understands that there is an acute urgency here, and I'm hopeful that uh, the conversations over the next few months will lead to, a, to productive discussions and ultimately a deal with the CHT. Well, and the healthcare system has been under a lot of pressure because of COVID-19, and we got an update today on COVID-19 numbers in this province. Hospitalizations because of COVID-19 are down. The number of people hospitalized is down to eight. A week ago, it was 13. There was also some other good news in today's update. There were no deaths in the last week because of COVID-19. This is the first time we've seen that since the province moved to weekly updates. Well, it's been 40 years in the making, but now the Trans-Labrador Highway is officially paved from west to the south coast, spanning 1,100 kilometers. Tourists and Labradorians were on hand yesterday as the last kilometer of pavement was laid. Here now's Heidi Adder was there. Asphalt was lifted into the spreader and laid out on the dirt-packed road for about an hour to complete the last kilometer. The Trans-Labrador Highway between Labrador West and the Straits is finally paved. Google Maps estimates it'll take you about 14 hours to drive end-to-end. -end. It's a wonderful day and I'm just so humbled to be able to share in this moment in history. It took about 40 years to get to this point. And while the paving is done on this section, some South Coast communities are still connected to the highway with dusty gravel roads. Dempster says the province will be working on a transportation strategy for Labrador soon, and that'll include looking at those access roads. The next step is we, we have to do engineering, we have to assess the cost. But that's not projects that we can take on on our own provincially. So we'll continue to dialogue with Canada uh, to see what they can bring to the table. In northern Labrador, there's still communities that can only be accessed by air or boat. Dempster says there's consultations ongoing and more about the pre-feasibility study should come later in the summer. For now, the highway here being finished was a relief for two tourists from Ontario. It's just so much easier on the trailer and uh, the truck and yes. everything. Marvelous. The Agnews were handed a Labrador flag for being the first ones to cross over the new pavement. The province is hoping it'll encourage even more tourists to visit the big land. Agnew has a message for anyone considering visiting. Don't miss it. It's worth the drive. Absolutely yeah. worth the drive. For sure. Whatever way you come, like it's uh, it's well worth it. Heidi Adder, CBC News, Cartwright Junction. Well, as Heidi mentioned, the highway project has been in the works for four decades. It started in the early 1980s as just a gravel road from western Labrador to Happy Valley Goose Bay. People at the time complained the road was in rough shape. In 1999, the Trans-Labrador Highway continued from Happy Valley Goose Bay through to the Straits eventually. Then, in 2009, the work began paving the road. We're going to have more of a look back as we dip into our archives a little later in the show. Well, a former investment advisor is in jail tonight after a judge handed down a federal sentence this afternoon. Joan McCarthy swindled over $700,000 from elderly clients over a 13-year period. Today, the Crown and Defence agreed on the punishment, but as Arianna Kelland reports, the judge didn't think he went far enough.
54-year-old Joe McCarthy came to court knowing she'd be leaving in handcuffs, and according to her lawyer, she was ready to take the punishment. McCarthy was an investment advisor at MD Management, a financial firm serving doctors and their families. For 13 years, she requested checks in her client's name, forged their signatures, and deposited their money into her own account. Over $700,000 was stolen from four people. Other victims have since died. MD Management paid all the clients back in full, and both the Crown and Defence suggested McCarthy only pay restitution to her former employer, not the bank that returned the money to the firm. But Judge James Walsh disagreed and said if she stole the money, she has to pay it back. Both sides later agreed she'd pay over $500,000 to the bank and over $100,000 to MD Management. That helped when it came to sentencing time, when Walsh reluctantly agreed to a two-year plus one-day federal sentence, despite it being on the low end of the sentencing range. So why did McCarthy do it? Her lawyer says there was no gambling or drug addiction, but it was for personal gain, overwhelmed with bills, taking care of her children and father, and keeping up a high lifestyle. A decision that her lawyer says has left her in financial ruin with a ban on financial advising for life and a sentence in federal prison. Joan McCarthy was given the opportunity to speak this afternoon at her sentencing hearing. She apologized to the victims, her family and her co-workers and said it's something she'll regret for the rest of her life. Arianna Kellen, CBC News, St. John's. from the Garrick Theatre in Bonavista. We're marking the 30th anniversary of the Cod Moratorium. So many communities in this province never rebounded after the moratorium began, but here in Bonavista, this has really been a success story. It's been a hub for tourism, and for the arts, and joining me now is someone who has been here for the good times and for the bad times, former Mayor Betty Fitzgerald. So let's start by going back back in time to 1992 when you found out that the moratorium was going to start? Well, first it was shock and then there was a lot of people uh, asking what are we going to do, where are we going to go, how are we going to survive? The Fisher was their life and that's all they ever knew. But some uh, decided, once they seen what was going on and what was offered, to go and retrain. So some retrained in the trades and part moved away because of that. But those who stayed, they decided they were going to fight for the fishery. And boy, did they ever fight. They are born fighters. They believed in what they were doing and they wanted their fishery back. And they looked at what else can we process in our plants that's going to bring us uh, money to live on. And they found that as well, it was crap. And since then, this town has been moved forward, not only in our fishery, industry, but also in the tourist industry. Yeah, when did that happen? When did things start to take a turn in Bonavista? Well, in 1997, uh, the Queen arrived. It was the uh, celebration of John Cabot's discovery. And everybody's seen, the whole world seen what Bonavista, it was a hidden jewel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people told me that. And from that, Mr. Gordon Bradley, God bless him, he's no longer with us. He decided that he was going to form a community called the Extory Townscape Foundation. He did that, and he restored a lot of buildings, including the Garrick Theatre. And as you can see, it's a beautiful theatre. And from that, they were, he, he kept on doing sidewalks and buildings, and uh, there was a lot of new business coming in at that time as well. And then a gentleman from the States, seeing what we were doing, and decided he was going to our local, and he was going to invest some money as well. So he hired the local, which is our mayor at the time now, uh, John Norman, mm -hmm. and uh, from that, then we seen new businesses, a uh, smaller business come and open up, like restaurants, B&Bs, and, and art galleries, and all those things. So vibrant here. And what so was, what our town like? come alive with the tourist yeah. industry, and, and is, I think it's going to thrive even more so, not only in tourism, but in our fishery, because we don't give up on our fishery. We never will. What was it like for you watching that transition 
for Bonavista, seeing it grow into this vibrant community? Well, it, it was first, uh, first when we started, we didn't really know we were going to do it. But after a few trips away to see how other people did things, we came back and we applied it to our community. For instance, uh, Baktouche, they changed their, their whole industry around. Then, and we went to uh, Perk and, all, and Rio Canal, where Kingston and all those little communities came together and they built their tourist industry. I came back to my town with the group that I took with me, and we decided, okay, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to have to start building our industry as well. But it included the fishery right along with the tourist industry. And since then, like I've been seeing a lot of good things happen in Bonavista. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to continue to happen. Bonavista is a town that people don't give up. They're fighters. They're people who believe in what they're doing, and they will fight for what they believe in. And I'm one of them as well. <laughs> I can tell that. And we're going to be, you know, looking at all of those businesses. Uh, you know, tomorrow on the show, we're going to be live again in Bonavista, as yes. I mentioned. Uh, Betty Fitzgerald, thank you so much for coming in and speaking. There's one more thing I like yes, to say. Yes, please go ahead. In the future, I'd like to see more people. Uh, come together, work together, mm -hmm. and see a great future for our young people because they are the future and we need to build that for them. One thing we have to see now is try and bring our health care around and make sure that we get good doctors here that's going to look after people and good roads. Uh, you came <laughs> over our roads, so I'm <laughs> yes. sure you know what they're like. So that's all I ask for the future is to see that everybody work together for a better future and I'm blessed to have each and every one of them because I know they'll do that. Well, what a optimistic, positive note to end on. Thank you so much, Thank Betty you. Fitzgerald. And, and you know, there are some people uh, in the pro in Bonavista who never really made that pivot into those newer industries, those newer businesses. And uh, coming up, we'll speak with someone who's still working in the fishery. He's a fourth generation fisherman who has very high hopes for the future. Well, gray skies over Bonavista tonight. What's in store for tomorrow? Well, Jeremy Eaton will be here with the full weather forecast. That's coming up next.
Well, Jeremy, we saw our colleague Carolyn is inside in Bonavista tonight because of the rain, and that's not the only spot getting a bit of rain tonight. Well, Bonavista certainly not is not alone in getting rain tonight. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find any spot on the island of Newfoundland that isn't going to get damp tonight. So I want you to take a quick look at this map and just take a look at all these rainfall warnings, which is a special weather statement from our friends at Environment. Canada. So let's just take a quick look now. If we zoom in on that map, you can take a look. Now I learned this earlier today and a rainfall warning is put into effect if you're going to see up to 50 millimeters in a 24 hour period and it's expected that parts of this province could see 40 to 60 millimeters of rain overnight and into to tomorrow. So if you take a quick look at this, you're looking at uh, Green Bay, White Bay, it's Deer Lake, the Humber Valley, all along the southwest coast, up the west coast, Corner Brook, Stephenville Bay, St. George, Burgio, Porta Basque, and up into Gross Morn. Now, I'm going to show you why all this rain is coming if we take a quick look at the future tracker. So you can see that the yellow, that yellow band here, and this is going to recycle a few times. So that yellow band is going to come up, and that's where the heaviest rain is going to be, is down in the Burgio Porta Basque vicinity, and then it's going to move its way up into. Uh, towards, um, move its way up towards into central as well. So what we're going to take a look at is the amount of rain that are going to fall. Now I know that it's been sunny for the last couple days, especially here on the Avalon Peninsula. So you can't blame it on me. You got to blame it on the rain. Hashtag Milli Vanilli. So let's take a quick look at some of these amounts that we're looking at here. So St. John's, you're looking at 5 to 10 millimeters. That's in and around the Avalon Peninsula. You're looking at about 10 to 15 millimeters in Marystown, Harbor Breton. In Central, like Gander, Clarenville, up in Bonavista, where Carolyn and our CBC team are, as well as in Twillingate, Grand Falls, Windsor, you're going to see about 10 millimeters tonight. And then uh, we'll just let me move out of the way there and you can see 20 to 30 millimeters there on the west coast and that's Cornerbrook and vicinity, the Bay St. George area as well into Stephenville, even as far as into Deer Lake, 20 to 30. But this is going to be the problematic part. This is where you're going to see the most rain overnight, 40 to 60 millimeters in Port of Basque. So that's going to go overnight and into tomorrow. But let's take a quick look now up into Labrador where it's going to be a lot drier. Now there could be some rain there uh, in and around the Straits and Cartwright. But for the most part, it's going to be pretty clear overnight, except here in Labrador West. As you can see, there's a risk of frost. I have the number four written down there, but it could get as cold as one degree overnight. So just keep an eye on that. Now, as for tomorrow, that rain is going to continue. As you can see some of the numbers here, I'm just going to step out of the way. So Porta Basque and Burgio, that area is going to get the worst, but you're going to see about two to four tomorrow. I think the heaviest part will be into central Newfoundland as that system moves its way up 10 to 15, 15 along the west coast, two to four up in St. Anthony. Now, if we move up into uh, Labrador, again, two to, four, two to four millimeters, sorry, of rain in and around the Cartwright area. It'll warm up into Nain and into Labrador City. You're looking at 21 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So it's going to be rainy overnight and into tomorrow on the island, but Labrador, you're going to look like you're going to have a nice day and then hopefully things will shape up better for Friday but we'll talk about that tomorrow. the show, I spoke with former mayor of Bonavista, Betty Fitzgerald, and she talked about the dark, difficult times just after the cod moratorium began in 1992. And fisherman Lee Tremblett was just a young man at that time. But despite all of the uncertainty, then he kept the family legacy going. He's still fishing today like his father did and his grandfather and his great grandfather did. And now he still has high hopes for the future. So Lee, tell us about your boat here, High Hopes. I'm a fodder writer built in uh, 1990, a couple of years before the moratorium hit there and uh, didn't know if it was a good investment or not at the time. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like the, the panned out and through tick and tin we made it there and, and on came the shellfish so he kept it in the family and mm -hmm. kept it running. And uh, while well, she's here now, 32 later, 32 years, she's been fishing. She brought her work so far, so that's a good thing. Uh, and you were 
were you were in your mid-teens when the moratorium was announced. Can you take me back to that time? What do you remember about that time? Oh, it was a pretty busy time here in Bona Vista. Was, uh, the plant was in full swing and everything, and once I guess uh, the stocks went down a bit and things started to turn, well, I guess people started to move away and bought other occupations and one thing or another, but uh, there's still a few guys out in with the fishing because, I mean, like I said, some years better than others. I was in school, I'd be picking up odd jobs mowing lines and I'd be over cutting out tongues in the plant there if you were allowed in and doing stuff like that. And, I went to work after the moratorium there first at the grocery store around here, local, and uh, everyone else was moving, so I said, well, I have to make a move too, and went to the mainland like, like a good many more, and I took... But you uh, came back? Oh, yeah. I could, well, Dad uh, was getting up there in age. He started to feel it, so I said, now, well, I'll see what I can do to help him out, and I got two kids of my own now coming up, so... Hopefully one of these days it'll be there for them. So that's what I'm hoping for now. I'm not saying they gotta be fishermen people, but they got a boat there anyway. So. But. Now why did you decide to come back with all of the uncertainty in the fishery? You decided to come back and to carry on your family legacy because you're a fourth generation fisherman. Why did you want to do that? Why did you make that choice? I guess that's just me. I guess I grew up on the beaches and picking up all the little creatures and stuff. So it's something I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And when I was working away on the mainland, it wouldn't, uh, you had that work vibe. It was good, but good money in some ways, but that's not where your art is. You had to do what you wanted, something you enjoyed, whether money was there or not. So I, I, I'm happy with my decision to come back there and. She, she's uh, working out for me so far. Oh. It's a very different Bona Vista now uh, compared to when you grow up, when you uh, grew up oh. here. A lot of changes, all of all of the businesses. How, how do you see Bona Vista these days and the opportunities that are available here? Oh, it's a great place to live. I mean, uh, we got a lot more, oh, I'll say, different businesses now than what we used to have. A lot less convenience stores and stuff, but. Uh, it was a great place back then, and hopefully one of these days now it's starting to bounce back. And uh, if we can get the plant there straightened out, there would be a lot of people working over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got crab now, but uh, if the cod come back, you could have a lot of people working there, and then opportunities for other people, for businesses, and like even the convenience stores you might see bounce back one of these days, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a great place for a family, and... Uh, like I say, there's uh, no shortage of work around here now. It seems like everybody's hard. But, uh, Wasn't like that in 1992? No, in 92 you had, to, you had to go to work at a grocery store or something you didn't really want to do. Mm -hmm. Either that or go away. Uh, you could have went to school, and a lot, of, a lot of people did, but some of them stuck in jobs now that they don't enjoy. So I got, uh, I'm lucky enough, I guess, to be able to take over what Dad left and... Uh, Make a go of it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for telling us about oh, it. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Yeah, perfect. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. And after that interview, Lee and I continued uh, talking about that family legacy in the fishery. And he did say that he has a 19-year-old daughter, Mariah, who's now in Alberta doing an engineering degree, I think, at, at university. And he said that if anyone is going to follow in his footsteps, it'll be her. So we'll see what happens there. Coming up, uh, we'll have more coverage from Bona Vista. We'll tell you about a beautiful documentary about the evolution of the town since the moratorium in 1992. Well, coming up tomorrow on CBC Radio's Labrador Morning, a new thrift store is open in Western Labrador, and the operator is hoping it'll help cats and kittens from around the province. Find out about the Mission Kitty Thrift Store. Then on Crosstalk at lunchtime, it's a Tech Thursday. Adam Walsh is talking to the founder and CEO of Metrics Flow about that company. 
Bonavista has become a major tourist destination in the province and every two years people travel there to check out the art installations as part of the Bonavista Biennale. Next, Carolyn speaks with the producer behind a documentary on the Biennale that we'll have for you tomorrow night on Here and Now. I'm Jeremy Eaton. The Federal Minister of Natural Resources is in St. John's this week and he's taken out some time to answer some questions. Thanks for joining us, Minister. Let's jump right into it. Recently, your government approved the Bay to Nord project. In your opinion, do you think that this could be the last one? Well, I, I said I spoke to the Board of Trade today and, and what I said is um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the role of fossil fuels as we move forward to a lower carbon future we are going to have to reduce the amount that we use and we are going to have to stop burning it eventually in 2050 but there's still significant amounts of oil and gas we are going to use in a net zero future we're just not going to burn it we're going to use it for petrochemicals and waxes and lubricants and hydrogen 
Um, and in that context, it's the lowest production emission sources that are going to actually be the most important on a go-forward basis. And so with Bay du Nord, I said very clearly that from my perspective, that's a good project because it is one of the lowest carbon intensive production barrels of oil that you are going to see in this country or in any other country around the world. Those are the kinds of barrels we're going to need going forward. I think the threshold for new projects is going to be, can you actually effectively copy what Bay du Nord is doing, which is very low emissions and a target of getting to net zero by 2050. Your colleague, the Minister of the Environment, seemed to cast doubts on the fact that the government will approve another project like this. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, there was a lot of looking into it for sure. Um, and, and uh, you know, I would say projects like that have often taken a reasonable amount of time to move through the regulatory process. So I don't think that was particularly novel. Um, and, and what the federal environment minister, I used to be the environment minister, what the federal environment minister has been saying is we need to ensure that we're giving proponents certainty about what the policy framework is going forward. And so one of the commitments he made um, when Bay du Nord was approved was that we are going to put in place a policy framework for all future projects that reflect the fact that we are driving to net zero, that reflect the fact that there will be a cap on oil and gas emissions that will actually decline over time. Projects going forward then, and proponents of projects going forward, will have certainty about what they need to do in order to actually meet that threshold. And as I say, Bay du Nord is a great example of that. It uses best-in-class technology, and it actually produces barrels of oil with virtually zero carbon emissions. When it comes to transitioning away from oil, in your speech to the Board of Trade today, you said that people tend not to fully understand what that transition means. In your opinion, what are people not getting? I think there's a couple of things. I, I think uh, one is that people have, have gotten to this perspective that somehow fossil fuels are the cause of climate change, and that's just logically not true. It is the burning of fossil fuels that is the cause of carbon emissions, which causes climate change. And so a lot of people don't understand that even in a net zero world in 2050, the International Energy Agency says we're still going to need a quarter of the amount of oil that we produce today and half the amount of natural gas. We're just not going to burn it. We are going to use it for all of these other applications that I talked about before. And so I think that's part of a conversation that we need, Canadians need to be clear about. Because even in a net zero world, we're not getting rid of all of the production of oil and gas. Um, the second issue that I think is really important is we talk about this low carbon future, but I don't think we've really painted a picture for Canadians about what that looks like. And I think for a lot of people, they think, well, that means everybody's going to have a solar panel in their house or there's going to be a wind turbine in everybody's backyard. That's not exactly what it means. Um, there are all kinds of jobs and industries that are going to be created that are going to be consistent with a net zero world but are going to actually leverage the skill sets that exist today. So the offshore oil and gas industry, a lot of those skills are going to be absolutely relevant to onshore and offshore wind development for the purpose of, of hydrogen. You know, critical minerals and the processing is a manufacturing job. We'll need manufacturing skills. And so I think one of the things that I'm trying to do through these regional energy and resource tables that uh, we are working on with Newfoundland and Labrador and will be working on with every province and territory is painting that picture of what the future looks like and where these jobs are going to be and what the skill sets are going to be required. My concern is not these days that we're going to displace workers and they won't have jobs. It's actually we're going to have more jobs than we have workers and we're going to have to figure out how to address that. What does the future look like for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who work in the offshore sector or in Alberta? What will new jobs look like for them? Well, I think Newfoundland and Labrador has some huge opportunities, but let me just talk about two. Um, one is the utilization of the wind resource. You have, you have great wind resource here. Um, for the purpose of actually making hydrogen, um, and you can use onshore wind and you can use offshore wind. I will tell you in the aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, we are seeing enormous interest on the part of the Europeans and the Germans in particular in securing sources of hydrogen from Canada and, and in particular sources of hydrogen from Newfoundland and Labrador. And, and that's so that they can actually accelerate the move towards uh, the energy transition towards renewables and hydrogen to make them truly energy independent. So we have an opportunity to seize that, to be an energy provider in a low carbon world to the world. And so that will drive jobs in the offshore it will drive jobs onshore in terms of wind. I, I was actually just meeting with Maersk and they're, they're thinking about how this actually will become a core part of their business. They service the offshore oil sector right now and their focus now going forward is servicing the offshore wind. So I think that's one huge opportunity for Newfoundland and Labrador. The other I would say is critical minerals where there is no energy transition unless we figure out how to actually produce more copper and lithium and cobalt and nickel. And 
Newfoundland Labrador has a lot of untapped resources of these critical minerals. There is a huge opportunity, especially in remote and rural communities, to actually help us with that challenge, to mine those critical resources, but also to process them here in Canada. And ultimately, we want to manufacture the batteries and, and manufacture the electric vehicles and a range of other things. I would say the critical minerals piece, from my perspective, is a generational economic opportunity, and it is an opportunity that is available to almost every province and territory in, the Canada, in Canada, but I would say Newfoundland Labrador Labrador in particular has a huge opportunity. The big attractions here in Bonavista is an arts festival. It's called the Bonavista Biennale. All across the town, you see sculptures, installations, and murals. It's just beautiful. The CBC's Mark Humby and Lindsay Bird did a documentary about the Bonavista Biennale as well as the reinvention of Bonavista itself. And Lindsay Bird joins me now. So it's called Project Bonavista. Can you tell us what it's about? Yeah, Carolyn, it's it's really about the revitalization of Bonavista in the decades since the moratorium. So looking at how this whole area has gone from cod to culture as a real mainstay of the economy, and in particular, the role that contemporary art has had in that revitalization. As you mentioned, the Bonavista Biennale, every other summer it sets up shop all across the Bonavista Peninsula, bring all sorts of different installations to just about every community. And we look at what happened during the 2021 edition of the festival. Now, this brings it to every single community. We interviewed the co-founder, Pat Gratton, and she talked quite a bit about how they wanted to get contemporary art out of the city, out of the white cube of an art gallery, and bring it to people and get people interacting and thinking about contemporary art quite a bit more. And this shows how that idea has been really successful on the Bonavista Peninsula and how the Biennale and the energy and the art it brings, it brings in tourists and it's helped revitalize this area alongside, you know, all the beautiful heritage buildings you see under renovation and all the businesses you see setting up shops. So we really look at all of the different contemporary art of the festival and how it fits into that larger scheme of revitalizing the area. So much to talk about. What will people see when they're looking at the, the documentary. So last summer, Mark Cumby, a video producer, co-producer of the documentary and, and director of the documentary, the two of us were out here for the week before the Bonavista Biennale got underway, capturing all of the energy and excitement of that week, kind of the hectic stuff as well of setting up what it takes to put all these installations together. So you'll kind of get like a fly on the wall version of the behind the scenes of the Biennale. You'll see stuff like an artist from Charlottetown who took a U-Haul, put an entire dinosaur skeleton, a life-size Albertosaurus, road tripped it all the way to Upper Amherst Cove where he assembled this skeleton in a field, made this whole kind of artistic comment on climate change. You kind of get a sense of what it takes to put a dinosaur skeleton together. Uh, you'll see Cornerbrook artist Marcia Heyer. She took an entire biscuit box house in Dunterra and she painted the entire outside with a team of volunteers to look like the peeling layers of a wallpaper that you would see in you know old houses around here on the Bonavista Peninsula, the same sort of motifs and decorations. So you kind of see those installations before they open to the public and get a sense of all the work and excitement that comes with the festival at the peak of summer tourism season. So, so much beauty, but also talking about some important issues. What are some of the takeaways from Project Bonavista? I think, Carolyn, it's a little bit about how change and revitalization are processes that take a long time and, and aren't particularly straightforward. You know, there's progress, but there's bumps along the way. Uh, you know, we talked to a bunch of locals for this documentary as we're making it, and their memories of the moratorium and those years afterwards really stayed with them. And you get a sense of how the history lives alongside the present. And we talk a lot about how the history lives alongside the present in the documentary because the artists are talking about it as well, about how we need to look back at our history and maybe reframe some things. Mm -hmm. One artist at the Biennale last year, Logan McDonald, his work uh, was all about how we celebrate the legacy of John Cabot in this area and how important and vital that is, but how maybe underrepresented the Beothic and Indigenous history is and, and how that might need to be talked about. So contemporary art gives us this ability to kind of walk into maybe some difficult conversations, whether they're about climate change or 
reconciliation and can kind of start some of those conversations and help us understand our own history a little bit better and make things a bit more inclusive. Oh, sounds wonderful. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I saw some of the, uh, the promos for <laughs> it and it looks just gorgeous. Lindsay, thank you so much for telling us about it. And if you would like to watch the documentary, it's actually going to be airing tomorrow night on Here and Now. So just tune into Here and Now and uh, you'll see Project Bonavista. Well, just ahead, we dip into our archives and look back at the start of the construction of the Trans Labrador Highway four decades ago. Stay with us. We talked about it a little earlier in the show, how the Trans Labrador Highway is finally complete. That final stretch of road was paved yesterday. Now, this has been a journey 40 years in the making. Construction started back in the early 1980s. Well, former CBC reporter Jacinda Wall was based in Labrador City at the time and had several reports about the progress of the project. Here's a sample of them from our archives. Construction has already started on the road, 
But this weekend, federal and provincial representatives, along with municipal leaders from a number of Labrador communities, gathered to officially mark the start of work on the Trans-Labrador Highway. This work is being done with money from both the federal and provincial governments. Both Transportation Minister Ron Daw and MP Bill Rompke cut a log as a symbol of the start. And they both reiterated their commitments to see that the road is completed. I think what we have to do, what the people of Labrador have to do, what the uh, provincial politicians and, and the bureaucracy has to do, as well as the federal people, is to make sure that uh, we don't let this, that there isn't even a slowdown, and that we have a, an agreement in place prior to the end of this present agreement. So, the commitment is there. Now all the people in Labrador have to do is wait for the politicians to reach other agreements. So the Trans-Labrador Highway does indeed become a reality. It's taken three years and $16 million to build this road. Along with being the start of the long dreamed of road link across Labrador, it meant that people in Western Labrador could travel into the country. The road isn't in the best shape. There are washouts, and occasionally, your vehicle can get stuck in the holes, as was the case with this man. The way they're going now, it'll probably cost them a fortune to try to get the road straightened out again. So far this year, the road has only been graded once. A highways department spokesman says that because the road wasn't considered open, no money was allotted for maintenance work. But people here say unless something is done to the road now, government could lose its $16 million investment. And they say that kind of loss is just not acceptable. Jacinta Wall, CBC News, in Western Labrador. Well, the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Roseanne Archibald, appears to have survived a significant challenge to her leadership. An emergency resolution for a confidence vote and her potential dismissal has been withdrawn at the Assembly's annual meeting. I didn't want to waste people's time debating this issue because uh, if it was going to be defeated soundly. Yesterday, a resolution to suspend Archibald and investigate allegations of workplace bullying made against her was defeated. A third resolution that would affirm Archibald as the national chief and launch a forensic audit of the AFN's finances is still pending. Archibald has been calling for the audit and for a complete restructuring of the AFM, claiming there is corruption inside the organization. She says those claims have led to the campaign to have her removed. Well, here's another shot of Bonavista before we head to the break. A live shot with rather gray skies. When we come back, we'll check in with Carolyn, who's in town for a couple of days.
number of Yukon communities are under evacuation alerts due to wired wildfires. Residents aren't being evacuated at this time, but officials are urging residents to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. The primary fire of concern is the Crystal Lake fire, which is burning out of control. The fire is about 15 kilometers away from the community of Stewart Crossing. Parts of the North Klondike Highway have been closed because of the unpredictable fire behavior. This comes as many northern communities are dealing with higher than usual temperatures. It doesn't set here right now, so it's hard to, uh, to get away from the sun. Uh, cool beverages, cold showers. There are heat warnings in effect in parts of Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Temperatures have passed highs of 28 degrees for the past two days, with some places battling the heat for even longer. Environment Canada says exactly. climate change is <laughs> intensifying the normal summer heat. Well, rhinoceroses are returning to Mozambique decades after they became extinct in the African country. A group of rangers traveled to South Africa to capture and sedate some black and white rhinos. The animals were then transported about 1,600 kilometers to a national park in Mozambique. The park is hoping to have about 40 rhinos added to the population over the next two years. Wildlife numbers in the country have been affected by poaching and a 15-year civil war. Well, from rhinos to dinos, if you're a dinosaur nut with a few million dollars to spend, you could pick up this rare specimen. It's a complete skeleton of Gorgosaurus, and it's hitting the auction block later this month in New York. The skeleton stands 10 feet tall, 22 feet long, and is one of the most valuable dinosaurs to appear on the market. The auction house estimates a price of $5.8 million U.S. for the item. The skeleton was unearthed in Montana and was found in 2018. A Gorgosaurus is a smaller cousin of the T-Rex and could weigh up to two tons. Look at that guy. Well, before we go, let's check back in with Carolyn, who's live in Bonavista tonight and tomorrow. Carolyn, what do you have on tap for the show tomorrow? Well, Peter, we'll be speaking with the current mayor of Bonavista. We'll be talking about the future of the town and we'll be showcasing some success stories, talking to some business owners in the town, the people who helped revitalize uh, Bonavista and bring new life into some historic buildings. And speaking of buildings, we'll also talk about the building that I'm in right now, the Garrick Theater, talk about the history of this and uh, where things are going for the future of Bonavista. And of course, we'll have Project Bonavista, the documentary as well tomorrow night on Here and Now. Excellent, Karen. I'm looking forward to that documentary, a chance to check out some of that interesting art exhibits there. Me too. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. That's Carolyn live in Bonavista tonight. She'll have lots more coverage for you tomorrow night. And that's it for us on Here and Now tonight. I'm Peter Cowan. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully, if you're in the island part of the province, you can stay dry over the next day with all that rain on the way. But fortunately, some nice weather for Labrador. That's it. Have a good night, everyone.